Good morning, everybody. You guys doing well? You're looking good. That's half the battle. Man, I am so glad to be here, glad to be in Florida, glad to be in your great city, and glad to be here with your pastors, pastors Josh and Kristen and the whole, their whole family. Man, they are a gift. How many know that? And you've been for a few weeks without them, and I'm sure you have, you have missed them. And I am uh, I'm the last speaker standing before you get back to hearing your pastor. Um, but uh, I, I've been, I, I watched the last couple of weeks as we've been in the series, uh, A Place for Prodigals. And, uh, and Pastor Wayne and Pastor Clint did an incredible job the last couple of weeks. And I want to kind of... Um, continue in that theme, but I don't want to belabor the point, but I do want to tell you how blessed you are. What God is doing at Liberty Church is extraordinary. Do you guys know that? It's amazing what God is doing here, what God is doing through your pastors and the leadership team and all of you. Come on, why don't you give yourself a hand clap? incredible, incredible to watch um, and to see the blessing of God from afar, but to be here and see it in person is, is incredible. Uh, met Pastor Josh, I guess it was about, about three years ago and fell in love with him, not in a weird kind of way, um, <laughs> but I was just struck by the, the strength, the authenticity, the vulnerability um, in which he leads. What, what a gift, what a gift that that is. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, my wife is here, and she rarely comes with me, but she wanted to come to Florida. Anywhere there's water, she wants to. <laughs> it's weird, but anywhere I preach, anywhere near the beach, she wants to come with me. But, uh, but she's here with me today. Uh, my best friend, my better half. And I've got a picture of my family, if you guys could pop that up. This is my beautiful family. This makes me a whole lot more likable. They are amazing. And my oldest boy, this is a little bit, I think, a year, year and a half ago, but, um, or no, it wasn't, nine months ago. But the two, the, the, uh, the older boys are, uh, just turned 20 and 21, and, um, the little guy in front of me is, is our baby, and he's about to, turn, about to turn seven in about two months. And the little girl right there is my favorite child. She is, she is, she is nine going on 16. And um, I, I'm blessed with, blessed with an incredible, incredible family. And, you know, people say, well, you know, why do you have, why, why are your kids so spread out? And I have to, that's a great question. But anyways, <laughs> Luke chapter 15, <laughs> Luke chapter 15, um, I don't have any uh, feats of strength to show you. I'm not a comedian, although I'm up here trying. Um, I don't have a, a Physique like a Greek god, like Pastor Josh. I think you have to work for that. I've got a, I've got a dad bod. I like to call it a, uh, a father figure. <laughs> is what I've kind of settled on. <laughs> and um, that's a new one. Yeah, that was a new one. That just came out of my spirit this morning. <laughs> but um, I, I do want, I do want to talk to you and encourage you for a few moments today, and we're going to continue in this theme of a place for prodigals, but I want to talk to you about a concept and an idea and really a problem, I would like to say, that plagued me for much of my adult life and um, spent uh, 20 years as a missionary to the nation of California and uh, let me just tell you, you guys have no idea how blessed you are to live in a country that is free. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, I better stop. Um, but this, this, this problem is something that, uh, and this is not leading to another joke, so you guys can breathe. Um, I know it's, I'm so funny. But uh, <laughs> this problem plagued me much of my adult life, much of my ministry. It informed a lot of the decisions that I made and it was something that I really had to work towards and really had to find freedom in this area, although I was called by God, used of God, and have known the Lord um, my entire life. I was raised in church, son of, a, son of a pastor, but this is something that I really had to work through, and I'm still working through. So um, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15. If you would oblige me and stand for the reading of God's word, I really believe that... Um, that the Holy Spirit can help us today and this can impact your life in a positive way. Luke 15, 17, one of the most familiar passages in the Gospels, Jesus tells this story. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants had more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. And if, if you've read, you can read the preceding verses. It's, a, it's an incredible story, and we'll revisit some of that in a moment. But Father, thank you for your word. I just pray that you would open up our eyes, open up our ears. Let us be made better by your word. Speak to us. Do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want, I want to start our discussion today by making a couple of statements. First is freedom is not about what you've been set free from. It's about what you have been set free to become. Jesus did not die and spill his blood to control our behavior. Jesus did not die for us to help us act better and to be good boys and good girls and to sin less. That's not the reason that Jesus came. Of course, as we walk with the Lord, as we experience salvation, there will be transformation and there will be change in our behavior and we should sin and or sin less rather and become more like Jesus but behavioral modification was not the primary issue that Jesus came to correct. This is not the primary problem that the gospel came to address. The problem that Jesus came to earth to correct was our identity. That we are no longer orphans, we are no longer slaves, but we are now sons and daughters of God. And our identity is not in what we do. Our identity is in who we are. And who you are is determined not by where you come from, not by what you've done. Who you are is now determined by whose you are. He didn't come to just save us. 
He came to adopt us into his family. And earthly adoption is such a powerful concept. And, and I really believe that it is a, a, a clear picture of what God came to do through Christ. Through the cross, he adopted us. And this gospel thing, this whole gospel thing is, it's about identity and adoption. And it's absolutely imperative that each and every one of us discovers who we are. It's absolutely imperative that every Christ follower understands who they are in Christ and they know what our, their identity is. A couple of questions to ask. The first is, what do you know to be true about God? Not the rumors that you've heard about God, not the scriptures that you've memorized, not the cliche, precious moment, sound bites about God, not bumper sticker theology. What do you know by personal experience? Jesus asked his disciples this question, who do men say that I am? And then he asked even a more important question, who do you say that I am? Not what your parents know to be true about God. Not what your church or denominational background tells you to be true. But what do you know to be true about God? Knowing about God is not the same thing as knowing God. Proximity to the things of God is not the same thing as salvation. And this is so important because if we are to become a place for prodigals as a church, as followers of Jesus, who God is to you will be who God is through you. So what's true about God? What do you know to be true about God? Secondly, what is true of you? In other words, do you know how God sees you? Not what everybody else thinks about you, not the labels that you wear, the words that were spoken over you, not your, not your facade, not your alter ego. What do you know to be true about yourself? Do you understand how God sees you? Who are you really? Who are we really? Who are we in the dark? I want us to examine for a few moments in Luke chapter 15 this, this prodigal son, as he is called. He is on this journey of sonship. And, and in, in Luke chapter 15, we pick up this story of this young man that is on a quest, even though he had to learn the hard way, he was on a quest to reclaim his identity as a son. And the, the parable is often called the parable of the prodigal son. And it's, it's often misinterpreted as a story about one son when the reality is it was a story about two prodigal sons, a younger, younger son and an older brother. And there's a reason that they were both put in this story, this parable that Jesus told because uh, this, this story hits everybody. And, and the, the story of these two sons were given so we could contrast them. And if, if you don't look at both of them and you don't understand that both of them are, are prodigals, you'll miss the message of this radical story. Jesus is telling this parable and it was a groundbreaking story. It was even a scandalous story, an offensive story to the culture that he was speaking to. He was challenging the, the hearers to say that everything that you have thought about God and connecting with God, whether you're in the East or in the West, ancient, modern, postmodern, everything that you think you know about God has been wrong. And Jesus here shatters all human categories. There was a historian that, uh, that, that once said that it's hard for us 
to grasp this because when Christianity first arose in the world, it was seen as anti-religion. For 200 years, the Romans called the Christians atheists because what Christianity was saying about God was so different from any other religion that it was shocking, like you can't believe in God. And so we pick up the story and uh, the younger brother comes to his father and, and says, Father, give me the share of my estate. Now the hearers of this, this parable would have been shocked and appalled. It was, it was the utmost disrespect. If you had two sons, generally in that culture, the older son would receive two-thirds of the inheritance and the other third would be distributed amongst uh, the other children. And asking your father for his inheritance while he was still alive was essentially wishing him to be dead. The younger son was saying, I want your stuff, but I don't want you. My relationship with you has been a means to an end, and I'm tired of it. I, I want my stuff now. But even more unheard of than the son's appalling behavior and his rebellion was the father's response. Because a traditional father, a, a Middle Eastern father in this context, would have driven the boy out verbally and possibly even given him a, a physical blows and attacked him. He's asking the father to divide his property, to divide his life between them. The, the father would have had to have sold off part of his land. He would have had to have sold off part of his, his business, which would affect his standing in the community. And I want to say this, just a side note, that God loves us enough to let us leave. He's like, you know, if, if you want to do things your way, he loves us enough to let us leave. And this is another hot take, but I really believe it's true. A lot of times God respects us more than we respect him. When we make the decision that everything that I have, and let me, let me just say this, because a lot of times we, we, we view the story of the prodigal and we think of this guy going crazy in Vegas and spending all of his money on, on prostitutes and partying and clubbing and drugs and all of that, all of that is true. But the reality of the story is that he took the father's inheritance and instead of using it for the purpose of furthering the family business and bringing honor to the family name, he took it as his and prodigal means to waste something and you don't have to go and hit rock bottom and waste everything you have on partying to be a prodigal the reality is we're all prodigals because any time that we take what God has given us, the time, the talent, the treasure, the gifts that he's given us, and we use it for our own gain and to our own means, we in that case are becoming a prodigal. And God loves us enough to let us leave. He says, if you want to make your business yours and cut me out of it, you can go ahead and do that. If you want to take your job, your, your employment, and say, I'm not giving a percentage back to God, he allows us to do that. If we want to take our family and our, our time and our talent and use it for our own gain and not to benefit the kingdom of God and, and, and the church that he loves, he, he loves us enough to allow us to do that. It happened in Judges, I think maybe 17 times. It says they did their own thing and they forgot God and, and, and went their own way. And in Romans chapter 1, he gave them over to their own mind and their own desires. He says, if you want it, you can have it. So the son takes the inheritance, squanders everything that he has, and finds himself in a pigsty. And just to tell you that a pigsty is a low place to be, but for a, a young Jewish man, it is like bottom, bottom of a place to be. 
I mean, by now, the, the friends are gone, the fun is gone, the money is gone, he's hit rock bottom, it's not fun anymore, he's broken, it's, he's cooked, it's done, it's done. And he starts realizing how foolish he has been. And he makes his plans to return to the Father, to confess his sin, and to ask his father to make him a hired man so that he can somehow make restitution and make up for all of the wrong that he did. And in verse 17, it says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against you and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. How many here have sinned this week? Please don't make me stand here alone. <laughs> the, the, those of you who didn't raise your hand are, are lying, so all of us are in the same boat. <laughs> when we sin, and inevitably we do and will, one of the most tormenting thoughts that the enemy brings is this. You have fallen out of favor with God and you are no longer a son of God. He beats us at the point of our identity. It's not that we don't believe in forgiveness. It's that we feel he lies to us and we feel that we have lost standing with God. Our identity is attacked. I, 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 love, I love what verse 20, Luke 15, 20 says. It says, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. His father ran to him. Now, let me say this. This would have been shocking also in their context because kids ran, women ran, Middle Eastern patriarchs did not run. The son was running to him to try to roll out his, rest, his restitution plan, but the father did not let him. He said, he said, listen, you are my son. He said, quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Get sandals on his feet. We're going to have a feast, and we are going to celebrate. And let me just tell you something. Fathers... Don't run to slaves. The father ran to his son. Fathers run to their sons. Dads don't run after orphans. Dads run after sons. He came home broken and shameful. He knew he had been a tool. And in addition to all of this, he smells like a pig. He is dirty and filthy and looks like a mess. But his father embraced him, wrapped his arms around him. And listen, here comes the big excuse. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Look at the heart of the father. He didn't say, go get yourself cleaned up first. He didn't say, you need a, a mani and a petty ASAP. You need an extreme makeover. You need, you need, he, he didn't say, we need to have an intervention. We need to invite Dr. Phil to help us confront. He didn't say any of it. Just as he was in his broken, smelly condition, he was embraced by the Father and he said, you are my son. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. You know what the ring represented? It wasn't, it wasn't jewelry. It represented authority for family business. He's saying, I am restoring you as a son. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter what you've done. The moment that you decide to come back home, the moment that you come to your senses, the father's running towards him. And I just want to tell you this, no matter how 
how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, the moment that you come to your, to your senses and say, I'm going to repent and I'm coming home, God is moving towards you and he wants to embrace you. He doesn't want to beat you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to love you and restore you because that's what fathers do. He said, for one second, you never stopped being my son. There was never one moment that you stopped being my son. Dirty, but you were still my son. Broken, but you were still my son. Acting like a fool, but you were still my son. We have four kids in our family. People ask, you know, a oh, strange question people ask, well, why do you have so many kids? And I'm like, well, I mean, because I really like having stuff broken. <laughs> My wife and I, we kept all of our house plants alive, and it just seemed the next, like the next logical step, start having kids. <laughs> or, you know, because it's really fun, and it's like living in a frat house. But... <laughs> For the most part, we have some amazing kids. And this week, they've been pretty good behaviorally. But they have their moments. And, and sometimes I want to stab myself in the eye with an ice pick. But even when they have a good week, even when they're good, they're always making messes. My car is always filthy. But you know, not one time have I ever thought about ceasing to be their father. Not, not one time have I ever, have I ever thought that, that, that their room's a mess and so their name shall no longer be called Fraley. And the, the reality of this is most of us as parents, like, we get that. Sometimes our kids get out of bounds. Sometimes they need correction. They need, they need boundaries, and they don't always obey. They don't always listen. Sometimes they're rebellious. But most of us here as parents, we get it. We love our kids, and they don't stop being our kids. We get that on a parental level, but when it comes to God, sometimes we wrestle with the thought, is God a good parent? And there's been times in my life where like, I'm like, you know what? I think maybe I'm a more merciful father than God is. Do we really believe that we're more merciful and long-suffering than God? Do we really think that our mistakes our sin, our brokenness is going to stop God from loving us or he's going to disown us or throw us out. And the, the reality is there's been so many times in my life where I have thought just that. And I really think that there's three postures and three identities that we can live out of. And every person in this room, under the sound of my voice right now, are currently living out of one of these three identities. Number one, some of us are living as orphans. And it's possible to be a follower of Christ and still have areas in our life that are not free. And if you were to put an ear to the ground and take a look at modern culture today, I really believe that we can hear the agonized cries of an orphan heart. Does anybody notice me, see me, value me, want me? Is there anywhere for me to belong? Orphans are just never sure if they belong. They can come to church and be blessed by the worship, blessed by the programs. And, 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 and I've seen people through the years that come set week after week, but never have a sense of belonging. 
Jesus dealt with the orphan spirit in John chapter 14, verse 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father to give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You have him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Orphans, displaced. Some of us live as slaves. And I really believe that this is something that I dealt with even after many years of ministry. The idea of being a human doing instead of a human being. And my life was defined by what I did for God. And John chapter 8, verse 34, said, Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Now I'm going to tell you how you know if you have a slave mentality. One minute you're in with God, the next minute you're out with God. One minute I'm born again, the next minute I'm not born again. One minute Jesus loves me, the next minute he's, he's ticked off at me. Because it seems so fragile. And if you think that everything with God is temporary, you're not a son because the son remains forever. Do you remember the behavior of the older brother? We didn't read it, but Luke 15 records it. He was furious. He was so upset about the celebration, about the cost. His dad was inviting him to participate in the celebration. He says, your son, which has been lost, has now been found. And all he could think about and talk about was, you never gave me a goat. You never gave me a calf. And he publicly humiliated his, his father and refused to go in to the feast. I want to tell you, we can live as an orphan, never feeling like we belong. We can live as a slave thinking that what we do for God is what gives us standing with God with a sense of entitlement or we can live as sons. And I want to tell you, beloved, that is how God has called us to live. That is the identity that he has called us to live out of. Galatians 4 verse 1 says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption. Everybody say adoption. As sons, and because you were sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. This is how we were destined to live, sons of God. You say, well, I've never had that kind of father. Listen, I'm going to tell you that the Holy Spirit was given to us to testify to us that we belong. Our spirit filled with the Holy Spirit cries out, Abba, Father. It doesn't matter if you never had a relationship with an earthly father. I want to tell you, you have a heavenly father that loves you, that is committed to you. Sons remain forever. All we have to do, we have to accept what the Father is offering. I really believe the Holy Spirit is here and, and, and God is wanting to change 
some identities. And I'm going to tell you, all it took for the prodigal was one moment. He says, I, I, I'm not going to live like this any longer. I'm going back to my father. It doesn't matter if you are living out of the identity of an orphan or a slave. You could be a prodigal. Maybe you've been running from God. I'm going to tell you that he is waiting with open arms to receive you. And he's, he's given you an offer. All you have to do is accept it. Just for a moment, would you bow your head and close your eyes? All of us need a radical encounter with grace. We need to see God for who he is and understand that unless we see him for who he is, we'll never see ourselves as he sees us. And if you're in this room and say, you know what, I, I, need, I need to make a fresh start with God. Maybe you're watching this in line. Wherever, wherever you're at right now, you feel the Spirit of God drawing you. And you realize, man, I, I've not been living according to the identity of a son. But I'm ready today to make the decision to give Jesus everything. I want to be a son of God. And I want to reclaim that identity. Maybe you've had that identity, but you're like, man, I'm not living out of that identity in the way that I should be. I need to make a decision today. I need an identity change. If that's you, you say, Justin, you're talking to me. I want you to pray for me. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Awesome. Beautiful. Come on, hold those hands up. I'm telling you, the Father is running towards you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. I thank you for every hand that was raised. Every person in this room, I pray, God, right now that there would be a shift of identity. Those that lifted their hands that are making a decision to come towards you, you're already running towards them. And we thank you for grace. We thank you for salvation. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen.